Hi everyone, welcome back to Bots to Lights. Today we're playing a solo mode designed by someone I greatly admire, Monrad Peterson, who, with his team from the Automa Factory, designed the solo mode for Stonemaier Games Scythe. Today we're going to play just with the base game, and I've nearly completed setup. We're going to play Saxons versus the Nordic, so one Automa versus me here. So I've got my faction mat here, and I've got one randomly selected player mat. Now this is really important, and it's a great little touch um, from Jimmy Segmeyer for how Scythe works. Because there's very little randomness in Scythe's basic mechanisms, there is some asynchronicity in the player mats. Each of these player mats is slightly different, so it's really important that you pick one randomly. Otherwise, you're playing the same game every time. Almost. There's a few other little pieces of randomness in the setup. You've got two random objectives, so we're going to take our two, and there's going to be three random factory cards. We don't get to see what they are, but not yet anyway. So three factory cards. Let's go back in the box. We've also got a random structure bonus. This will change some bonus points up at the end of the game. We'll talk about how the game is won in a little while. We'll just finish setting up some tracks. So the Automa is blue. They start here with 10 popularity. And the other track is called power. And you start with a number of power given by your faction board. For me, it's just one. For the Automa, it's four. We start with four combat cards. The Automa starts with just one. These are the combat cards. We get to look at ours, we don't get to look at theirs. We'll keep this face down for them. Incidentally, these are some Roxley iron clay chips, poker chips, which you could use instead of coins. These are the coins that come with the, uh, with the game. Um, I have been using those, but I'm going to use these for the sake of the video, so forgive their presence. All right, so we've got objectives, we've got combat cards, set our tracks, we've got our three factory cards. We've chosen a level of difficulty for the Automa. It is the normal difficulty. We place one of their little cubes here on the number one spot. Scythe appears complex, but it's pretty straightforward. It's so well designed, everything's kind of laid out for you. You'll want to grab these reference cards when you're playing against the Automa because this makes your life so much easier. And again, it's well designed. It's, it does the job perfectly well. The aim of the game is to win as many of these coins as we can by the end of the game. Right? Think of them as victory points. The trigger for the end of the game is getting six stars out on the board, whether that's you or another player, or if you're playing solo, the Automa. Okay. So six stars out on the board triggers the game end, then you count how many points you've got or how many coins you've got. Coins you'll accumulate throughout the game. Your stars are placed up at the top left here on this triumph track. These are goals, little short-term goals for the game. You can place one in each of these different spots. There's ten spots, but only six stars need to go out. So you're not going to fulfil everything. In fact, you shouldn't even try to fulfil everything. You've got to focus on six things. So, for example, this is get four mechs in play. This is get eight workers in play. This is win one combat. This is win a second combat. Okay, so there's lots of different ways of doing it. This is get 18 popularity on the popularity track. This is get 16 power on that power track at the bottom right. This one is complete one of those two objectives that we took a moment ago. This is get four of your reserves in play. We'll look at these things in a minute. This is get four buildings in play. And then this one is complete six upgrades. Now if you look back at your faction map, these are the four mechs that need to be one of the targets, one of the short-term goals. This spot here is where one, two, three, four recruits get placed. These are your four recruits. 
these are your four buildings, these are your six workers, and these are upgrade cubes. All right. So remember, get six upgrades, four buildings, eight workers, there's six here, two begin on the board already, so that's eight total. All right. So these are all short-term goals. Get six of them completed, and that will trigger the game end. And at game end, you're going to score points, or coins, according to what you've managed to achieve out here on the board. How many coins you score is dictated by your popularity. So if you've managed to get, say, your popularity up to the eight spot here, you're in this middle section. And this middle section says, which is where the old timer begins, this sort of middle section says you get four coins for every star you've put out. So if you triggered game end, you've got six stars, that's 24 points. If you're only here in popularity, that's 18 points, right? The next column says, let's say we'll back up here, get three coins for every territory you control. This is the map of Scythe in the world that we're trying to fight over. This is like an alternate history, 1920s Europa. There's a capital city here called the Factory. This is our home base. It depends which faction we're playing. And each of these hexes, where our workers are, is a territory. For each territory we control, we control a territory by having one of our units in there. We get a fixed number of points. Okay? So if our popularity is up here, then it will be three points. And then finally, we get two points here or one point here if we're further up the track it's more points finally we get for every two resources that we control we get a fixed number of points each of these territories so i control two territories right now with my starting workers right in those territories might be resources so in these mountains for example there's metal in these tundras here there's oil it might be that you'll have other resources, but each territory produces a certain kind of resource. This is called a village. It produces more workers. And the type of resource it produces determines the type of territory it is. So oil is tundra, metal, mountains, forests produce wood, and farms produce food. Okay, so at the end of the game, if we control territories, this is my character. I have one. This is a unit as well, just like a worker. If we have units in a territory, we control that territory. For each two resources in the territory we control, scores us a number of points as well. Okay. No territory can have units from two different factions in it at the same time. In fact, your workers can't move into territories where other factions are. Your combat units, which is your main character, can. And this is what these mechs are for as well. Remember one of your goals is to get four mechs out on the board. That wins you a star, one of your six stars. Mechs and characters are called combat units. They can move into territories where there's other units, whether it's workers or other combat units. But when that happens, then combat happens. And this is where the game delivers lots of interaction, because you will be doing combat with opposing factions and in the case of the solo game that means against the automa all right so area control fighting for resources building an economy all good euro game stuff right should we kick off let's see how this game works now i begin the game remember here's my six my six stars here on my faction map i get two objectives that's these. Let's have a, we'll have a look at them in a second, because that may dictate how we begin the game. And our player board also says we get three popularity and four coins. Now, the popularity is important because it dictates how many points we score for stars, territories and resources we control at the end of the game. So we're going to start, and it's worth a star itself. If we get right to the top, we get a star. The interesting thing is, and this is where timing comes into it, getting your six stars down triggers the game end, but that doesn't necessarily make you win. So you've got to keep an eye on your opponents, because you may trigger the um, end of the game 
and end up losing because your opponent's got more coins, they control more territories, that kind of thing. So we start with three popularity, according to our player board, and four coins. The coins come in lots of different denominations. We've got a three and a one. The Ultoma starts with five coins. Okay. They don't have a player mat, so they don't have a flavour here that determines their actions and their starting stuff. So we are, we've randomly drawn Militant, right? So that sounds like we're going to be combat heavy. Now as it goes, that kind of marries nicely with our faction. Every faction has its own special ability. The Automa ignores this, but ours says dominate. There's no limit to the number of stars you can place from completing objectives and winning combat. Remember I said, one of the six stars you can place, or one of the ten goals where you can place your six stars, is to win a first combat, win a second combat. Playing Saxony, I can do a third, fourth, or more. One of the goals is to complete one of your two objectives. For Saxony, we can actually complete this objective twice. So normally you would only be able to put one star in each of these boxes, but Saxony, they can put two stars in here. They can put any number of stars here, any number of stars here. All right. That's our special ability. Nords says your workers may move across rivers. On the board there are rivers and lakes. Our workers cannot cross rivers and lakes. Nords can. Right? They've got the swim ability. Like I say, Automa ignores this ability. All right? And then they've actually got rules of their own. And this is how Morton has... Kind of given the Automa its little edge over us as a fully intelligent player. All right. Combat cards, we'll learn about these when we get to them. I've got three yeah, not so good ones and one really good one. Looking at the numbers in the top left here. All right, let's have a look at our objectives because this may determine some of the things that we want to do at the beginning of the game. Now, you could ignore these completely. Remember, Completing one of these objectives is just one out of ten possible stars. Right. But given we're Saxony and we can get two stars from these, we might be interested in these. It says have zero factory cards and control at least two territories adjacent to the factory at the end of your turn. Okay. And then population advantage, control at least three village territories at the end of your turn. Okay. This is our home. This is a river. What that means is at the beginning of the game, our workers are restricted to these three home territories at the beginning of the game. Right? They can't cross these rivers. The only way for workers to get across rivers is via a mech. Okay? When mechs get deployed, they can carry workers with them. Your mechs and characters can cross rivers once you get this upgrade called Riverwalk. Okay. And when they do so, they can carry, the mechs can carry workers with them. So that's how I'm going to get my workers out here beyond my home region, okay. or my home peninsula. The Automa doesn't suffer the same limitations. The Automa's workers can kind of teleport around, but this little marker here on the Automa card says at the beginning of the game, can't cross rivers either. Only once this token's advanced, and this is going to advance like this, only once it advanced to this spot can it start crossing rivers. All right. So at the beginning of the game, we're both kind of restricted to our home peninsulas. All right, cool. What else do you need to know? I think that's about it, really. Um, we can never occupy these lakes. We can cross over rivers, but we can't occupy lakes. Lakes are kind of like no-go areas for us. Right? There are tunnels. Tunnels, you can go down a tunnel and up a tunnel. So as we move our units about the board, tunnels kind of act as these little shortcuts. There's six of them around the factory here. Um, I need to get a mech out to get this river walk ability. So that's kind of where I'm focusing my, my plan at the beginning of the game. I know that I'm heading towards the factory, that one of my objectives makes that a goal. 
I know I'm going to be militant, so I'm going to focus on military. Control at least three village territories. Okay, so we've got a village here, we've got a village here, we've got a village here. So I can get one, but I really want to get my mechs and workers out. Okay, okay, cool. This game is all about trying to fulfill those objectives quicker than your opponent. Uh, in solo against the Automa, the sooner you can do it, the better, because that's given your, the Automa less chance to build up. I'm going to be quite aggressive because I'm a militant, so I'm going to be going after the Automa. And the Automa is going to kind of spread down the map towards the factory and then beyond and potentially try and take out some of my units as well. The Automa is quite aggressive. But we've got some short-term goals to think about. Now, every faction is kind of limited in how it can cross rivers. I can cross rivers into forests and mountains. So my way out of my peninsula, here we've got farm, village, farm, forest, forest. So I'm going to be heading this way and then this way because here we've got a farm and a village. So I'm going to have to cross here and then come out and explore this way which kind of works fine it may be that I'm going off to this village or this village it may be that I have to go this way all right let's see let's see the actions you can take are determined by your player board there's four actions in each of these four horizontal spots and you have an action token you place it in one of these four spots to say which action you want to take all right so your the main four actions are bolster which is how you push your power up. Move or gain. Move is how you move your units about or gain money. Okay, they're together. Move, gain. Produce. Have uh, your workers kind of farm the lands, produce resources. Or trade, which is where you can actually buy resources. Let's go and trade. Each of these four actions has an upper and a lower. Right. The lower costs resources. We don't have any resources right now. We're going to trade. We're going to buy some resources. Okay. So we're going to do the top bits. Anything you see in red is a cost. Anything you see in green is something you gain. Now, these other spots here, these are upgrades. This is what you open up with the upgrade gain here. We'll talk about that when we get it to it. It's a bottom action. These are your buildings. Okay, got an armory, a mill, a mine, and a monument. They reveal green effects. So, for example, when I move here, I can use the mine. Okay, once I've built it. All right, at the moment, I can't use these buildings. I've not built them. Okay, build is the bottom action of produce. So, what does this? What does what? What happens when we when we take this action here? We work our way from the top down. It says pay one coin. All right, let's pay one coin. It says that you can trade with a worker two resources or, and there's a heart here, gain one heart, gain one popularity. If I were to upgrade this, it would be gain two popularity. Right, we're going to do the trade. Right, gain two resource tokens, any two. In combination of oil, metal, food, or wood, and we place them in a territory control with at least one worker in it. You may say, Well, why are you spending money to buy stuff when your workers can produce stuff? There's a couple of good reasons. In the moment, I don't have access to any farms, I can't produce food, so it is a good way of trading for food. I can't produce food, the only way to get it is through trade right now. The other thing is, it's a bit of a shortcut. All right, producing is an action in itself. I can get my workers to produce stuff, but you know it's an extra action. I might want to do that in a minute, but I think this is a fine strategy. Now remember, our workers are here on the land. Workers produce stuff, but they also help us with trade. Uh, I'm going to grab two metal. My workers can produce metal. I've got a worker here in the mountains, but I'm going to go and trade for some metal. Now, unlike other games, resources you own, they don't sit in your player area. Okay, They're actually up here on the board. They belong on the land. It said trade for two resources. It could be two different ones. I could get a food and a metal, for example. But I'm choosing to take two metal. 
but resources belong on the land, not in our play area. It says place them in a region with one of my workers. Inside, resources sit on the land, right? They could be spread around the land. I control those resources if I have a unit there. So I I can't put this metal here, I don't have a worker there. But if there was a metal here, it's nobody's until they get a unit in there. Then I control the territory and I control the resources on it. So if I want to spend those resources, I need units on those territories where the resources are. But the other thing about workers is when they move, they can move resources with them. So you could have workers in far away places producing resources that then are vulnerable to attack from an enemy who could then kick out your workers, steal the resources from those lands, Okay, the crops that you planted are suddenly theirs. But workers can, transported across rivers with a mech, remember, bring resources back to a place that's relatively safer where you can control it more easily. All right, so Scythe has lots of different layers to it. Workers produce resources, resources sit on territories, workers can transport resources around the map. All right, so there's all sorts of things going on here. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna produce, or rather trade for two metals, and I'm gonna plot them here. They don't have to be in the mountains, just because this happens to be here doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. I could have put them anywhere where I've got a worker okay right that's the first part of my trade action done i don't have an armory so this bit i don't do i don't gain a bonus to my power for taking the trade action right so i ignore that not until i've built this armory then i'm going to work my way down it says pay three food and if i pay three food i can do the enlist action which means enlist one of these recruits and get one of these bonuses. Remember, enlisting four recruits is one way to get your stars out. Right, we don't have any food right now. We don't control any territories with food on them. So I can't pay the bottom action. So these bottom actions are not immediately available to you, not until you start getting resources. That's it, I've completed an action. Now the important thing is on my next turn, I can't take this action again. This action token has to be moved. This is the neat design part. The next action I take, I have to move my action token to either the bolster, move or produce actions. Right? One of these three. Once I've done one of these, then I could move it back here if I want and trade again. Right? So this is just a neat little way of saying you can't take the same action twice in a row. Right, that's it. I've done. That's it. Simple. My turn is over. Let's move to the automa. So the Automa has an Automa deck. I'll give this a little shuffle. There's two stages to this Automa. Stage one and stage two. Stage one, we're doing the green part of the card. When we move to stage two of the game, which is when this blue marker moves to this spot and beyond. Right, we're in stage one right now. This is stage two. Then we flip these cards and we start doing the red actions. All right, so green to start us off, we're just doing level one. It's kind of like starts slow and then speeds up. Right, how does this thing work? First thing we do is we draw a card. We take a look. Remember, we're ignoring anything apart from the green section. We ignore these bits down the side. This is used for combat. All we're looking at is this green section. Now, if we were playing on the easiest level, or to meta, then... This first symbol says, Automa skips his turn. All right, and that's it, back to me. We're playing on the Automa level, normal, so we, we ignore this symbol, this symbol that says, miss a turn. Okay? Now we've started with something quite complicated, but we're going to work our way down. There's three steps, actually there's four steps to this card. First action says, um, we're going to get this little reference card to help us. This is, we've got the combat icon, we've got a, a number, number six, and then we've got this uh, character or mech icon. 
Look at the reference card. The condition says automa has power greater or equal to x. x is 6. The automa's power is currently 4. So we can't do this one. We're going to skip it. So we go beyond the slash. Okay. Now, so we ignore this. Or, this slash, when you see this slash, slash, it's always an or. Or, then we've got another combat action. Let's have a look. That's this one. Make an attacking move versus a worker. Okay. It says, select the Automa combat unit closest to Automa's base. Okay. The Automa's only got one combat unit. That's his character, and it's currently sitting on his home base. So that's the selected combat unit. Okay. Workers are not combat units. Combat units are characters or mechs. The next thing it says, choose all the valid hexes for this thing. It says, in the neighbourhood of any Automa unit or in the neighbourhood of Automa's base that contains an enemy worker and has no enemy combat unit. In the neighbourhood of, you're going to hear this throughout the Automa's turn. Or in the neighbourhood basically means it's in one of those six hexes of an Automa unit, right? One of the six adjacent hexes that that unit could move to. Automa ignores tunnels. Forget about tunnels. We'll come to tunnels on our turn. So at the moment, there are no enemy workers okay, in the neighbourhood of an Automa unit. So it can't make an attacking move versus a worker. So we're going to skip that action too. Next, so we can't do this one, or we can't do that one. Then we've got a third choice. It just is, This one is just a regular move of a worker. Let's find the card for it. Right, this is so nicely designed. Okay, it says move a worker. All right, let's see if we can do this one. It says select Automa worker, the one closest to the Automa's base. And, and there's a tiebreaker here. It says reading order. Okay, let's have a look at this. Which of these workers is closest to the Automa's base? This is the Automa's base. They're both equally distant. So it said tiebreaker, tiebreaker reading order. Reading order is left to right, top to bottom. Okay, so in reading order, this one, is our selected Automa worker. All right, now let's see, next step. It says valid hexes. Valid hexes are in the neighborhood of any Automa unit or in the neighborhood of Automa's base. They have no enemy unit on them and they have no Automa worker on them other than the one selected. All right, so let's go through that. What are our valid hexes? In the neighborhood of any Automa unit. I've got three Automa units out at the moment, right? Units on home bases don't have neighbourhoods. Remember that rule, they don't have neighbourhoods. So in the neighbourhood of an Automa unit, it doesn't have a neighbourhood. The neighbourhood of a unit is the hex it's on, plus any of the six adjacent hexes, or territory, that it could move to. All right. Now remember, at the moment, the Automa cannot cross rivers. All right. This cube says it can't cross rivers. So... Let's consider each of the Automa units. It says in the neighbourhood of any Automa unit. I'm going to use some yellow cubes here. So our selected unit would have a neighbourhood of itself. That's any of the six adjacent territories. All right. There aren't six, actually. It's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. It can't cross rivers, so it can't move to these two. They're out of the question. In the neighbourhood of any Automa unit, okay, is these three hexes. The hex it's on, plus any of the six adjacent ones that it could move to. That's the neighbourhood of this one, so we've got to consider any and all Automa units. There's another Automa unit here. Now, it just so happens its neighbourhood is exactly the same. The hex it's on, plus any of those adjacent ones that it can move to, it can't cross rivers, so not those. So again, it's these same three hexes. All right, bingo. All right, what's the next condition that describes valid hexes? It says in the neighborhood of any Automa unit or in the neighborhood of Automa's base. Automa's base has t always two territories in its neighborhood, right? The two on its home peninsula. Right, we've already selected those, so we don't have to worry about that. Next condition says, has no enemy units. 
So if there was an enemy unit here, that would discount this one, right? for example. No automa worker other than the selected one is the final condition. Okay, this is not a valid hex because it has an automa unit on it that is other than the selected one. Okay, this is our selected one. So this remains a valid hex. All right, we've identified the two valid hexes. It's just two of them. Next step says, step three, pick up the selected worker, worker. pick him up. Next step four, choose the destination hex. It has to be a valid hex. There they are, there's the two. It has to be in the neighborhood of the most automa units. So out of those two, which one do I choose? It's the one that's in the neighborhood of the most automa units. Okay. Units on home bases don't have neighborhoods. This hex is in the neighborhood of one automa unit. This hex is in the neighborhood of one automa unit. Right, they're still equally viable at the moment. Next, it says not in the neighborhood of enemy combat units. Neither of these hexes are in the neighborhood of enemy combat units. The only combat unit I have on the board is my character in my home base, which doesn't have a neighborhood. Okay, next tiebreaker. Both of these are still viable. Tiebreaker one says the hex that is closest to the factory. The factory's here. This hex is one two away from the factory. This one is one, two, three away from the factory. This is our chosen destination hex. Choose your destination hex, all right, this one. Then it says, place your selected worker on the destination hex. Bang, job done. And that's it. Now that seemed, seemed complicated, but once you've done it a few times, it's actually really obvious. Okay, it's just written in such a procedural way that you can't get it wrong. Here we go. We've moved our automa worker. We've completed step one of the automa card. All right, so we've done the top line. Now we push our way back down the card, all right? So we've done the move worker. The next step says it gains something. All right, so this is like an action. The second one is always something it gains. Right, it says it gains two coins. We'll give all timer two coins. The third one says if I have any recruits, remember these are recruits that generate bonuses, get them now. All right, we'll come to that when it happens. But at the moment I don't have any recruits. This is always a benefit for me by the way, not for the Ultoma. I don't have any recruits, so we ignore that. Then the final part is this star in the middle. If it's grey with an X, we do nothing. If it's golden without an X, we move this up the track. All right? And it's progressing towards being able to cross rivers. It's moving towards zone two, where we do the red part of the card. And also it's moving towards putting stars out. Remember, six stars out would end the game. First star is here. Two, three, four, five, six. That's it. We've finished the cube doesn't move there's no gold star here right. job done that's all Thomas turn now back to us